word there. Okay, because I know there's two people that can't be here today because of other obligations. They've already cleared it with me. So that, you know, fine. Life goes on. Whether you're on an airplane or you have a conference or something else, it's real life. Okay, so yeah, so today I had prepared to go over some more examples of logistic and Poisson multi-level models. But as far as I know, most everyone's not doing generalizations on their course project. Most people are doing continuous outcomes on their course projects. So the idea of doing post hoc Cohen's D and post hoc simple slopes is probably more timely that we cover today and then push off the generalized models. What do you guys think? I'm I not prepared that. for it, so it might be a little clunky, but I think it might be more timely for you. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay, so let me share my screen, first of all. Okay. Okay. Let me see if I can get this to, come on. So I'm going to put you guys' pretty pictures up here on my big monitor. And then I'm going to keep R down here on my little monitor. Can you guys see my R screen? Yeah? Thanks, Mike. Okay, so I'm going to, let's see, let's go, let's pick a good example. Oh, let's put it on the other screen. Let me bring this over here. Um, let's go to the encyclopedia. So I was prepared. We did this amenorrhea with contraceptive example of a binary outcome last time. There's another one with this, um, with binary and another one with Poisson count data. We'll hold off on that. Let's go back up. Let's go all the way back to our two level popularity example. Okay. You guys remember this popularity example way back when? Okay, do I need to make my um, text bigger? Is this a little bit bigger? Yeah, it's pretty tiny. Okay, I've been having my R on my big screen, so I had it pretty tiny. Yeah, 80%. Let's go 110%. Is that more legible or do I need to go bigger? You're good? Okay, we'll go with this size. Okay, so just to get us all up, back up to um, um, In this problem, we have children nested in classes. So that's where the need for a multi-level model comes from. We have students that together are in classes. So we have two levels of sampling. We have a sample, sample of classes and a sample of students. And so we have variability for student to student variability and class to class variability. And we have measures um, it's on the pupils and the classes. We have extraversion, which is specific to the pupil. And we have um, experience of the teacher, which is specific to the class. So let's come down to where we have our final model, shall we? So let's go down. To, this was our final model. We had sex of the student as a main effect, the extroversion of the student with cross-level interaction with teacher's experience and random intercepts and slopes for ex extroversion. So there's our model. Oh. Where's data pop? Told you this would be a little clunky, but we'll get there. Uh, all the way up. How far does it go? There we go. Oh, that's even more. Where does this data come from? There it is. Okay. Maybe I ought to run everything above. Ever leave a project and come back and like not get it to run down at the bottom? 
There we go. Okay, that works. Let's go to the final model. So there's our final model. So here's our table. Okay, so we have three three independent predictor variables: sex, which is girl versus boy, extroversion, which is a, I think a ten point scale, teacher experience, which is number of years the teachers taught, and then the interaction between child extroversion and teacher experience. So we make this is our great. Oh wait, I don't want that one. Not this one. There we go. We make this. So this is my favorite new function: the interactions package, the interact plot command. You tell it which. Oh, I knew it was going to do that. Didn't want it to do that. The interaction package interact underscore plot. Turn off. There we go. Okay, and then we can make the quickest plot for the interaction possible. So we tell it which model. Fred is the predictor that's going to be on the x axis. It has to be continuous. Mod x and mod 2 are possible moderators or other variables in the model. They can be categorical or continuous. So here we go. It has chosen the way I put it in, the pred variable, teacher extroversion, is our x-axis. We need a continuous variable on the x-axis. The mod x is always what it makes the lines by. Now, teacher experience is a continuous variable. So by default, it's going to choose to draw different lines for the mean value and plus or minus one standard deviation. And then if you give it a mod two variable, it panels by those. Now, these lines are different slopes. So we, when we're interpreting this model, what's the first thing we're gonna wanna interpret? Interaction. The interaction. So interaction is between extroversion and teacher experience. So when we look at this plot, we see there's a different slope, slope being the role of extroversion. There's a different slope, extroversion, for various levels of teacher experience. Now, if I want to find the slope of each of those lines, it's called simple slopes analysis. And I'll show you, it's the interactions package. And I, as soon as we're done with class today, I will knit this and push this to the website, to the encyclopedia, so it will be in the encyclopedia. It'll also be in this recording on YouTube. So we made this quickie plot by using the interactions package and telling it to make an interaction plot. We're gonna use that same interaction package, but we're gonna ask it for the simple slopes. Simple slopes. And you give it the same type of information. We want the model to be pop lemur to RE, that's our final model. Our main predictor, the one we want the slope of is the extraversion and the moderator would be teacher experience. So it gives us this nice little bit of output. It's just very, so I love this. I love this. I tell you, I love this. So it tells us Johnson name and intervals. In a sentence, it says, when teacher experience is outside of the interval 29 to 37 years, the slope of extroversion is significant. Note the observed values of teacher experience is 2 to 25. So for all of the observed interval, the slope is significant. Okay, good deal. Now here comes the simple slopes analysis. So it tells us when teacher experience, and again, it's going to use the mean and plus or minus one standard deviation off of the mean to tell us the slope. So when a teacher has 7.7 .7 years of experience, that's the average takeaway standard deviation for teacher experience, the slope of the line is 0.61. So this is the slope of extroversion predicting student popularity. So for this lightest dashed line, this is it says minus SD. So this is the mean minus SD, which is 
7.71 years of teacher experience, the slope of this line is 0.61. When the teacher has average experience, that's four, a little over 14 years, the slope is slightly flatter. It's only, instead of being steep at 0.61, it's a little flatter at 0.74. If the teacher has a lot, has more experience, like 20 plus years, that line is even flatter at 0.29. So this will tell you the slopes of each of these lines. Now, it just did the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. What if we wanna put in our own numbers? You can do that too. What is teacher education range? Teacher experience range between? It ranges between two and 25 years. So you can think the way you do mod x, values. And I could say 5, 10, 20. I can plug in my own numbers and it will tell me the slope when the teacher has, if the teacher had five years, if she had 10 years, and if she or he had 20 years. So you can let it pick the mean plus or minus one standard deviation, or you can choose your own values to plug in. Now this is giving you the slopes of those lines here. I'll take this one out when we didn't say, when we don't say any, it just does mean plus or minus standard error. So that can get us to compare at different levels. Now, what's the role? So that to interpret the this, interaction. This interaction is between continuous and continuous. The only way you can interpret a two-way interaction between two continuous variables if, is with simple slopes. The slope of one of those continuous variables at a specific level or set of levels for the second continuous variable. Now what about, so that gets us the interpretation of extroversion and teacher experience. So if I was going to write a sentence here, I would say for classes, stu for students whom's, whose, whom's, whose teacher has average experience, mean equals 14.26 years, a one unit increase in extraversion is associated with a nearly half point increase in popularity. And that slope is 0 0.45. Again, this is for average experience here. Standard error equals 0 0.02. And the p-value for that slope is less than 0 0.01. Now, I don't know how to get a third decimal on these p-values. That's my only gripe here is it only gives p-values to two decimal places. I would like to see them in three, but. So that's, that's. I, I'm talking about the average, that's this long dash middle line. But then what's the role of teacher experience? Teachers that have less experience, that relationship becomes steeper. Teachers who have more experience results in a flatter line. When the teach, teacher has more experience, this association is less distinct. Um, and when teachers have more experience, this relationship is more pronounced. Okay. So again, this is a continuous with a continuous covariate interacting, continuous interacting with continuous. Now in this example, we have a categorical variable 
That's sex. Is sex involved in an interaction? No. So when we look at this plot, what's the difference between boys and girls? If you look closely at those plots. Shaking of heads, what does that mean? <laughs> Just the intercept. Just the intercept. They're all shifted up or down. How much? Girls go up one and a quarter points. So that's the main effect of girls. Um, so then we'd say girls have higher popularity after controlling for teacher experience and ex, uh, pop controlling for their level of extroversion and their teacher's experience. And this is beta equals one point. What was it? Two, four. Standard error was 0, 0.0, small number. What was it? 0, 0.4, p-value less than 0.001. So extroversion and teacher's experience cannot be talked about in isolation. They have to be talked about in conjunction with each other, but students, sex or gender, male, female, that can be talked about in isolation because it is not interacting with anything else. So that's actually, can you scroll up to the model like where it shows those different coefficients? Those coefficients, yeah. <clears throat> so sometimes, because I've seen it, Mm -hmm. Maybe I haven't seen it and maybe I'm just imagining like how extra there's the interaction effect right now between extroversion and teacher experience. Mm -hmm. Can I think, can you have that interaction and then where the teacher experience main effect not be significant as a main effect at all? Correct. That happens all the time. That's okay. why when you have two variables involved in an interaction, you never even look at or try to interpret their main effects because the main effects might be meaningful, they might not. They might be significant, they might not. The main deal is with these two variables, you have to interpret them in conjunction with each other because there is a significant interaction with, between the two. So I guess, so my question is like in a case like this where it still indicates significant teacher experience as a main effect after accounting for the interaction, do you then also talk like accounting for teacher experience in an interaction effect that also has a main effect of blank? I would say no. Okay. If there is an interaction, do not talk about the main effects of the variables that are involved in the interaction. That's a really good question. So this says the main effect of teacher experience is 0.23. But that's you've got to hold the extra holding extroversion constant. But it also you can't the role of teacher experience has two prongs. You you can't interpret the main effect without also looking at the interaction. And that's why it's important to make these plots and to do the simple slopes analysis. Okay, let's look at another example. So let's look at the nurses example. This one, we had three levels of sampling. So we have three levels in our multi-level modeling. We have nurses, well, they did a sample of hospitals and then within each hospital, they selected four wards or floors or sections. And then within each ward, they cho chose some nurses. So we have three levels of the sampling sample. We have hospitals and within hospital we have wards and within wards we have nurses. So let's go down to the final model because that's what we're focusing on is final model interpretation. Um, it's running, here's down here. I have, it's running everything. Okay.
Come on down. Let's see, in this final model, final model, we have, we're looking at the stress the nurses feel. The nurses rated their stress and we have this experimental condition. They were, um, experimental condition, age, gender, and experience. Age, gender, and experience are per specific to the nurse. So those are level one covariates. The type of ward, I think it was general versus specific. That's a level two variable because it applies to the ward as a whole. And then hospital size is um, a level three covariate because it applies to the hospital as a whole. And then we have an interaction between cross-level interaction between hospital size and experimental condition. And then we have some random intercepts here and a random slope. Okay, let's look at, did that run? And here's, here's our model. So in this model, we have one variable, one interaction. Again, this is between experimental condition and hospital size. And here's our interaction plot. Okay, it has chosen, so both of these, this is the numeric grand mean center. I don't wanna do that grand mean center. I'm just gonna do experimental condition. Let's see, how does that do? Come up here, this hospital size. I'm not going to do the ground mean centering. I think it's stupid to ground mean center the categorical variable. I'm not alone in that thought. Okay. Okay, here's. Oh, okay. Haha. -ha. Yeah, found one. <laughs> Category, our interaction here is between experimental condition, which has two levels, and our hospital size, which is small, medium, and large. So you're in treatment or control, and then small, medium, and large. So that's a two by three interaction, categorical by categorical. So when we try to do this interaction plot, it croaks because it tells us that the main predictor cannot be a factor. But I found because somebody else did it for their project, we can change this to cat plot. And it makes a categorical marginal plot. It does not connect the lines. So blue here is the control, the where we had the, um, in, now if we remember, the intervention was a how to deal with the stress workshop. And they randomized it not to the nurses in general, not to the hospitals in general, but they randomized it to the wards. Each hospital had four wards. Two of them got the intervention and two of them didn't. And so the randomization to the interventions at the ward level. But here, the blue we have, these are the wards that were con um, the con got the control condition versus the orange ones are the ones that got that training intervention. And does that training make a difference for everyone? Does the training reduce stress? At the small, for sure. For small hospitals, it looks like in small hospitals, that training really works. It reduces the stress level. In medium-sized hospitals, maybe not so much. There's an overlap in these confidence intervals. What about large hospitals? Doesn't seem to be doing much of anything. So the plot shows you that, but this is where Joey says, I might wanna get Cohen's D. I might wanna get a Cohen's D for treatment versus control in small hospitals and a Cohen's D for treatment versus control in the medium hospitals. And then a Cohen's D for treatment versus control in the large hospitals. We would expect that the medium and the large hospitals that Cohen's D is going to be very small. And in small hospitals, the Cohen's D is probably going to be substantial. 
So it's gonna be a little clunky. I haven't done it this way. We're gonna try it this new way. So we're gonna again use the enter actions package. Instead of doing simple slopes, we're gonna do simple margins. I haven't done this one before, but I think it's gonna work the same. It's always great if we these packages that have consistent formats. So we're gonna tell it what model. That's this one. And columns there. Huh? You've got three columns there between your interactions after your interactions package. Oh, that will not fly. Thank you. I'm having a doozy of a time um, typing today. I just hospital size. These don't have to be quoted, by the way. They can, but they don't have to be. Um, and then mod x equals, I'm thinking it works the same way. Let's see if it works. You ha must have the margins package installed to use this function. What do you think we should do? Install the margins package. Let's go ahead and get it for it. <laughs> so I'm going to go to my packages tab, install, and I'm going to margins package. Go get it, R. Get what you need. I've never used it before, but if it'll make this run, and I'm hoping this might give us a Cohen's D too. If not, I know how to get it work around but if it could do it for us that would be so great i'm loving the interactions package period okay where are we okay simple margins let's try hmm don't we need to load it as well in the library um i don't think so oh it still wants it still wants pred to be a, a factor, not be a factor. Okay, well, I know how to do this a different way. I was hoping that would be consistent. That would be too nice. Okay. This is the way I need know to do it and it builds on ANOVA. I'm gonna use the EM means. And if you've taken um, 6600 from Tyson and I, we use the EM means package after we run the ANOVA. And we can say, what's the estimated marginal mean for the experimental, what was it? X con, experimental condition. Oh, and this is where typing is important. Uh, I'm going to do within each HOSP size. Okay, it's gonna think for a second. Okay, so these numbers are the numbers that are in the plot. For small hospitals, there's the control group and there's the treatment group, 5.5, 3 point, almost four. So this is at about four and five and a half. Now, the thing that might make this difference is there are other variables in this model and how it handles the other variables in the model. Here it says it's averaged, averaged over gender and ward type. That's different than using the reference category of gender and ward type. So that makes, so here it says 3.96. This looks like it's not 3.96, it's like 3.8. And that's probably why. Um, this one's also using Kenward Roger degrees of freedom. The default, I think, in this method for these confidence intervals and estimates is using the Satterwhite degrees of freedom. So sometimes they can be slightly different. That's why I was hoping that the interaction package would do it for us so that it would be consistent. But then we can do pairwise tests. Now I'm comparing in experimental condition within each hospital size. So here we get the, po these are post hoc T tests. So for small hospitals, treatment versus control, they are different by one and a half units and that's statistically significant. Hospital size medium, the difference in average stress level control versus ex experience is 0.43 units and that is also statistically significant. 
So looking at this plot, medium-sized hospital looks like there might be a lot of overlap, but that overlap is in 95% confidence intervals. You can have 95% confidence intervals overlap a little bit and still be statistically significantly different. So that's why it's important to do an actual pairwise test. What do we notice about large hospitals? When we compare treatment to control, it is not significant, okay? So that gives you p-values for pairwise comparisons. Now we want to get Cohen's d's to go with each of those pairwise comparisons. And this is where it's a little tricky. And I spent like an hour today trying to get a workaround. Who's, who's pro was it for someone's project? I think it might've been mine. Yeah. And I was also uh, looking around after and I actually found oh. in the, um, EM means package, there's an effect size function, which I got to work for me. Okay. Um, How would I do it then? <laughs> Let's make you be next. <laughs> Spur of the moment, that's right. <laughs> um, so what you have to do is, okay. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. I so could share my screen for EM a second. Means, EM means first? Um, you have to create like an EM means little, is it a data grid? You know what I'm yep. saying? And then you can do an effect size function on that data grid where you specify the, the sigma or the standard deviation and then the estimated degrees of freedom. Okay, so let's go. This is how you learn about things in package. So we're going to go to the package. I'm over here in my little multi-tab area, and I'm going to go EM means. And again, I'm spelling wrong. Then you click on the package's name, and it will list out all of the functions that are in part of that package. So do you remember what it was called, Carter? There's effect size right up there, EFF, EFF size. F -size. Sorry, I muted, I muted, but yeah, that's, yeah. that's the one. Okay, so standardized effect sizes are typically calculated using pairwise differences. That's a Cohen's D, a pairwise difference of estimates divided by the standard deviation of the population providing the context for these effects. The function calculates effect size from an EMM grid object and confidence intervals for both of them, accounting for uncertainty in both the estimated effect and the population SD. So this object has to be, okay, so we're gonna do, let's, let's play with this, shall we? We're just playing. R is a sandbox, it's so fun. Okay, where are we? Right here. Yeah, this is really useful though. I would think a lot of people probably wanna be doing this after our analysis, so. Oh Thank yeah, you. and which is why I changed up the schedule to do it today. So I'm asking what class this is. So this is what we did before to get those pairwise tests. And then on the end of it, I'm saying, what class are you? And it says class EMM grid. Yay, that's what we want. So we're gonna do EM means package EFF size. Okay, that's our object. Let's see what I'll do if I just do that much. Oh, I probably needed my open close parentheses. Sometimes it doesn't like that. Um, unused arguments. Okay, let's scroll down here and look at some examples, shall we? Examples are always helpful. So EM means sigma equals, oh, we have to do a sigma equals sigma. Here's a mixed model example. This is using LME. Oh, you've got to combine the covariances to get the sigma. Okay. Okay, here's our model. I can say we need a sigma, a variance that's standard deviation. Okay, it doesn't want to give us that. Um, okay. 
So let's see, let's do the var core. Their example in here, the help menu is using the nlme package. We're using the LME R. We don't have it, so let's see if it's the same. Here are our standard deviations, but we, okay, so the total standard deviation, we need to add those together. Let me see. Let me see their example. So they're adding, add them together. Okay, square them, add them together, and then take the square root. That's the pooled standard deviation. So they're usually, all of those. So we need to get the variances. Did you find a different way to do this, Carter? Mm, no, and I'm, I'm worried I didn't use quite the right value because I was um, I was using the same standard deviation that we had. That you and I had gotten? Um, yeah. Which was the baseline standard Yeah, deviation. and that's, that's another way to do it. Let's see if we can get this way to work. Okay, so here I, I've asked for what are the variance components in our model? So we've, in our model, we have residual variance. We have an intercept hospital ward to ward variance and side of a hospital and hospital to hospital variance and then experimental condition um, differs by hospital. So we have all four variance components. So we wanna add up these four variance components and then do the square root of the total. So we wanna summarize, we want to sum all the variance, convo variance covariance components. And then we want to square root it. Let's see if that'll work. There we go. And if we pull that out, let's do this. Total variance. The total variance. Let's pull that out. And then square root that. Okay, so we're going to call this sigma. So let's put that here. Oh, I have an extra S there. It's going to cry. And that's not very nice of me because this is sigma and that's sigma. Didn't like that. Oh, we need EDF. What's EDF? Effective. I think that's estimated degrees of freedom. Um, estimated degrees of freedom, yeah. Uh, okay, so what did they, um, this, I figured it's somewhere between five and 51, because they have five blocks and 51. I don't like guessing like that. Oh, he did it at both. Let's call this total SD, like they did. And it's not the same as Sigma. <laughs> no, I gotta rerun that under its new name. Um, we got NAs. Why do we get NAs? Did yours work, Carter? It did. Um, and a, a difference I'm seeing is that I, uh, I put in, like I put in a value for the sigma instead of, I guess, referring yeah. back. Um, well, I could do that. I could take this value and put it here. But it's still not. Uh, 
Hmm. I think I also, let me see. Did you not do this pairs? Maybe that's it. Mm. That's there. it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that Sorry, was- what did you just get rid of? Can you, I missed that, what you just deleted. I deleted the pairs. So when we did it up here, we had pairs to give us the pairwise comparisons. So see, it has it's collapsed each pair. Uh -huh. Here, I didn't collapse the pairs. Okay. So we are getting an effect size. Holy hugeness! A Cohen's d of one point eight. Whose eyes just bugged out? <laughs> but when you look at this, are those different? They're way different. They're one point eight five standard are almost two standard deviations apart. So not only is it statistically significant, it makes a huge impact for small hospitals. Okay, so this effective sample size, what happens when I change it? It probably won't change the Cohen's D, but it probably will change the confidence intervals. That's my guess. So it's using the Kenward Rogers degrees of freedom, which is fine. Okay, um, let's see. Let's write these down and see if it does change. Or I can, here, I'll do it down here below. Then I'll, I'll copy that, paste it here. So let's do this with 10 and let's do this one with 100 and see how similar and different they are. Okay, so let's see. Let's do the small hospitals. 1.826, 1.826. Okay, so changing the degrees of freedom didn't change the estimate. What about the standard error? It changes the standard error, so it changes the confidence intervals. Usually when we um, give a Cohen's D, we don't put a confidence interval around it. Um, so the other way to do it is to take, and this is what Carter and I were talking about today, instead of having this total standard deviation like pooled all over, you can take the outcome at for control group, and that's like a baseline, which one's baseline and do the standard deviation. We don't have a clear baseline here, so that wouldn't make much sense, but just for kicks, let's go back. What's the name of this data set? Data nurse, okay. Data nurse, let's do And what's the outcome? Pop, you layer T, that's not it. What was it? Stress, popularity was the last example. Okay, stress. So there's all, oh, stop, stop, stop. Okay, so let's see. Let's filter to just the control group. What variables control? AXP con. And what is it? Where's experimental condition? right there. We just want the control group. Where's that? There, control. Does spelling matter? You betcha. Okay. Summarize. Okay, that's the standard deviation of stress for the control group. What did we get for our sigma measure? Where was that? Ah, oh, that's when we did the sigma total. Here's where we get the standard deviation of just the control group. 
what do we get when we do the standard deviation of everyone? Oh, so which measure of standard deviation should we use? The pool standard deviation, the standard deviation of everyone in one pot, or the standard deviation of just the control group in one pot? Which one does it use? Which one does it default to? You have to tell it one. You have to tell it what sigma to use. Uh. Which SD to divide by? You have to tell it. So based on their help menu, I did this total standard deviation by taking all the variance components, adding them up and square rooting them. So this is, um, so we add, I'll make this up here. So the sigma, oh, my cap locks is on. So here I did the pooled SD. And how do we do this one? We added all the models variance component, and then we took the stand you guys that are all black you better be eating something because i'm starving and that must be your excuse for not having your screen on right <laughs> so this is we'll call this option one this is one option. Uh, second option, you could do the SD of all stress levels for all participants. And then this one is option three is SD of stress levels for participants in the con Role group. Okay, I don't think that any of these are right or wrong. I think that it's important that you are transparent by saying which one you did. If I had to guess, I would go with this first option. All you have to do is replace the model with the name of your model, and this should run. So Carter, I changed my mind. I learned something better. And then this degrees of uh, this degrees of freedom will only uh, I'm gonna put it up here. Um, so usually it's your sample size minus number of parameters, but sample size means something different when you have multiple levels. So um, the Degrees of freedom only affect the standard error and confidence intervals, which I suggest you do not report. So just throw any old number in there. Okay. So if so I was would you, sorry, would you be able yeah. to sometime like upload these new notes with the addition? I will be um, as soon as class is over, I'll knit this. It takes about a half hour to knit it, and then I'll upload it. So by late tonight, it will be updated. Yeah, thank you. Just for reference, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. So notice I here in the EM means I said tilde wave experimental condition vertical bar hospital size. These are both categorical variables. So it's going to compare the inner experimental conditions within each hospital size. So I'm getting a Cohen's D comparing experimental conditions within each hospital size. So let's see. So we would, to write this up, we would say, for hospitals of, that are small in size, the intervention 
does decrease stress levels. And um, the Cohen's D equals 1.83. So first I would say um, a, an interaction between hospital size and intervention was found. And that's where I need to put the beta standard error and p-value for the interaction, which was, yeah. Since it's categorical, the interaction has two betas, right? So I would use, if you use the ANOVA command with only one model in there, you get the F test. So this F, I'm gonna write this down. The F value has degrees of freedom in the numerator two and the denominator 22. The F value is 17.50 and the P value is way less than 0 0.001. So I would say F, 222 equals 17.50p less than 0 0.001. So yes, there is an interaction. Then to describe the interaction, we could, looking at the plots, hospitals that are small in size, the intervention does decrease set stress levels, so it does substantially. And then, and we can put, what, what's the difference? See, there's not a good symbol for mean difference. Mean difference is how many points? 1.55, so I'm gonna copy these numbers. This is, the pairs gives you how many units it goes down. So the stress level goes down um, and that's the standard error. We usually don't put the T value. We will put the p-value and the Cohen's d. So maybe mean difference, often we use a b. I don't know that that's. So it went down one point, oh, let's do two decimals. 1.55 points on average, that was the mean decrease. Um, by 1.1 points. <laughs> <How's that? laughs> so if you're in a small hospital, the intervention causes stress levels to go down 1.55 points with this standard error, which is statistically significant, and Cohen's D effect size shows us it's very large. For hospitals that are medium sized, the intervention has a small effect. Small, um, intervention does decrease stress, but by a modest, how many points did it make it go down? A lot less, only by less than a half a point. modest points. And we ought to put these all to two decimal places to be um, consistent right here as well. P equals um, D. And what do we get for a Cohen's D for those model moderate? That's a Cohen's D of 0.51 is not anything to sneeze at. For large hospitals, the intervention was not effective. 
at reducing stress. And then here we can give just the p-value because there is no effect. So um, where's the p-value? Okay. Let's go, oh, it's point. No, oh, but we're gonna have to round that up. So this puts in words with numbers, what we see in this plot. Drastic decrease in stress for small hospitals, modest decrease for medium-sized hospitals, no difference for large hospitals. Does that help in how to do post hoc Post hoc pair wise tests. Um, this is for when interaction is between two categorical predictors. Who has an interaction between two categorical predictors? Carter? Jolie? Carly, a couple of you. Who has an interaction between two continuous variables? Anyone have an interaction between a continuous and a categorical? Mike? Yeah, you can have those. Let's see if we can find one of those. Um, and you said you're even going to actually put this, all this stuff you're working on, this code, you're going to like sync it up into our, our encyclopedia? Tonight. Awesome. awesome. Okay. What's good is this to me if you can't have access to it? Plus, next month I'll make work on a project and I'll be, how the heck did I do that? The encyclopedia is for me as much as it is for you guys. I go and copy off of it almost every day. Because, you know, why recreate the wheel? So, yeah, I'll pretty that up and we'll get that on there. Okay, what other examples do we do? There's the popularity, nurses. What about Finch's reading? Let's look back at the Finch's reading. What kind of interaction did we, do you have to have an interaction in your model? No, you don't have to include an interaction. Interactions are interesting research questions, but they're not necessary. I'll make sure, um, as I've met with a few of you, it seems like a lot of you are questioning yourself when you're fitting your model and you're like, well, how do I do all these things I learned? Well, a lot of the things we learned in this class, only a subset of those things are going to apply to any one example, or any one analysis you run. So you don't have to have interactions in every analysis. You don't have to make a plot on every analysis. You don't have to do all of these things in every analysis. I just want to give you the tools in case you need them. So a lot of the examples in class do in fact have lots of interactions. Okay, what do we have an interaction? Here? Oh, age and vocab, that's too continuous. SES and vocab, that's too continuous. Okay, let's see. Did this one have an interaction? No. No. What about the autism example? Final model. A, oh, this has a continuous by a category. Oh, but it's got with times squared too. Ooh. So we've got a categorical variable interacting with a continuous and a continuous squared. This would be a good one to do. Where's our, where's our plot? That's our plot. Okay, so this one has time and time squared in it. And then it has a grouping variable. Group is high, medium, low. Um, we can't do simple slopes when you have quadratic time. So that's out. But we can do pairwise comparisons at specific times. Do 
do we want to have a break or should we just push through for 10 minutes and end early? Ah, end early, got some <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> okay, let's go into this one. This is the autism example. Let's, let's go to that one. Autism. Okay. All right. Final model. Final model. Okay. Run all above. We'll let it run. Okay, so simple slopes are good when you have an interaction with a continuous and a continuous or a continuous and a categorical, provided the continuous does not have a quadratic effect. Simple slopes have to be only for linear effects. Um, categorical with categorical, you want to do pairwise comparisons. If you have quadratic by categorical interaction, that's what we're going to attempt to do right now. So these, these are all post hoc analysis after you found your final model and that final model happens to have an interaction in it. How you tease that apart to be able to explain it. We can see it in a plot, but how do you actually tease it apart to explain it with words? Okay, so I'm gonna come down. So here's our interaction. Okay. Okay. There we go. Black and white. Okay. Yeah, let's go here. So I'm going to call this post hoc compare it there is sense. Okay. So what do you think of looking at this picture? Um, let's say when the child reaches age 13. So we're looking at the Vineland social, socialization age equivalent. So how well the child is socializing age equivalently wise. Um, let's go all the way. Let's do comparisons at age 13. So when you're doing a, a pairwise comparison, where you have a continuous variable that's interacting, you have to choose a time at which to compare it. So if we're going to compare at age 13, what do you want, what do you think is going to be shown? Low and medium? Or is there going to be a group difference? What do you think? Low and medium, these two dotted and dashed lined. Nope. What about the high group? probably going to show pairwise different from both of the other two, but let's, let's go ahead and do that. So, oh, I need the name of the model. Okay. So we're going to do the name of the model. Let's see if we can do it with the EM means. EM means. All right. EM means. Okay. So we want to compare the communi initial communication, that's our categorical variable. It's the SICDG group variable. Now, when I put it in to EM means, oh, did I spell it wrong? Oh, it has to be tilde wave. It has to be tilde wave. Close. We get this little note. It says, note, results may be misleading due to being involved in an interaction. So we have to give it a value because right off the bat, it's averaging over all ages. We have to give it an age at which we're going to do it. So um, I don't know how, I don't remember. I don't remember how to use a package. Oh, that's too many M's. You can do question mark that function package name and it'll bring up the help menu or you can put it in the little magnifying glass at the help menu to pull it up. So there's something in here about setting values. Setting values, how was it? By, by, I think it's by. Let's look down at the examples. Nope, 
Hmm. If not, I know another way to do it. Um, is it just age? Variable age, is that what it's called? Oh. Didn't like that. Did it do it? Let's see. Let's see if I change it to a different age. It didn't give me an error. What if I change this to a different age? It should give me different predictions. It did. It's doing it. Hallelujah. Okay, let's see if this is realistic. Now, when we did our model, what variable was in the model? It wasn't. It was age minus two. Does anyone remember why we did age minus two? Is this the autism data set? Yeah, this is the autism data set. Was it because the the um, age of the kids, like the youngest is two, right? Something, something All like the kids started at age two. So we wanted zero times zero to be at age two and then go up from there. So their age is always starting at two. So what would happen if I put age two in here? Then we should get, we get eight, nine, and 13. Let's look at our pot. Eight, nine, and 13. Does that look realistic at age two? Now we really want to do age 13. You have to pick an age. Age 13, we got 42, 48, and 100. Does that look about right? 42. 48 and 100. Yeah, that looks about what's on the plot. So this is how you would get those values. And then now we want to do, we could do copy, not delete. We can do the pairwise post hoc by just adding the word pairs. So EM means gives us the estimated marginal means. Adding the word pairs on will compare low to medium. And what about that p-value, p low to medium? How different are they? They're six points different, and that is not statistically significant. If we look at our plot, low and medium, they're six on average, they're six points apart. That is not statistically significant. Notice those confidence bands are almost completely overlapping. But the high group is different. Now, this get, these estimates here, these are how different they are in points of the outcome. We can talk about these, but we also want to convert it to a Cohen's D, so it's a standardized mean difference. This is just a point difference, not a standardized difference. OK, so to do Cohen's D, oh, let's, what do we do over here? We had to get the, was it here? Yeah, we had to get that total standardized, standard deviation, that sigma amount. So let's get that. And all I'm gonna do is swap out the name of the model. We already developed the code, so that should give us the standardized, the standard deviation, the pool standard deviation. Yay. Now, I'm going to do the Cohen's D. Now I'm going to use this comparison. Yeah, where'd it go? I hate that when you slide it over, it like jumps sometimes. Okay, what do you think? Will it run? It did, and it did all the pairwise. So this effect size does all the pairwise. I was wondering about that, good deal. So between low and medium, low and medium, we already know up here that it's not statistically significantly different. And the Cohen's D is actually pretty big. Wow. 
What about high the high group is statistically significantly different than low and medium and check out those effect sizes. The Cohen's D is eight or seven. What do you think about a Cohen's D of seven? That sounds like crazy, crazy. It sounds crazy. Usually if the Cohen's D is much bigger than one, it's, they call it, I forget what they call it, but it's like it slaps you in the face. You don't even have to look at anything. The Cohen's D is one or two, it's ginormous. But if you look at this plot, how evident is it that that high group is different than the other two? It's massively different. We almost don't need a test to tell us that. Now, these two down here, the low and the medium groups, they're not statistically significantly different at age 13, but the Cohen's D is 0.8. Now that is the Cohen's D, but look at the confidence intervals. The confidence intervals go from positive to negative. So it could be that low is higher. It could be that medium is higher. It could go either way. So because of that, I wouldn't get too worked up about this confidence interval. That's a pretty big number, but look at the standard error. Again, our effective sample size might be um, totally bogus, the degrees of freedom. Let's change it to something else. We still get positive and negative numbers on that confidence interval. So even though 0.8 seems like a big Cohen's D, it could go either way. It could flip flop in direction. So that mirrors the idea that the p value is not significant for that comparison. So to write this one up, we'd say that the chill, autistic children who are initially good communicators at age two continue on a much higher trajectory and end up at age 13 well above those that started out medium or low communicators. But the media, those that started medium and low follow almost identical trajectories and both end up about the same spot at age 13. All right. All right. We didn't have a break, so I'm good to stop here. Um, hopefully this was beneficial for your course projects and for more firmly understanding post hoc analysis on multi-level models. I will shift those generalized logistic and Poisson examples till, let's see, what's today? Is it Tuesday? What day is it? <laughs> yeah, it's Tuesday. <laughs> to next Thursday, we'll do those examples. Okay, so due dates. When are you supposed to exchange your paper with your peer? Thursday. Thursday. If that's going to be a problem, please talk to the person you're trading with. If they are okay with it, I'm okay with having it go another day or two, but be kind to your peer reviewer. Be kind to each other, right? So you have on Canvas, the what you're supposed to be looking at in your peers paper, you can use that as you write your own paper because that's what your peers gonna be looking for. Give it to them, you know, just check off the boxes. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. I think that I have a fair, well, knock on wood, a fairly open schedule tomorrow, unless it, yes, the middle of the day tomorrow, I have a fairly open schedule. So if you need immediate emergency help, let me know. Um, so that we can get these to your peers so we can get on with the next step of running some analysis. So again, I'll stay on, but we'll see you later. Thank you. So Sarah, the homework 10 on the calendar is not actually due. On yeah, Thursday. let me delete those right now. And then, then you. you don't have to worry about it because I know it makes some people nervous. It would make me nervous as a student. I was that kind of student. <laughs> I'm, I'm more just forgetful than nervous. So I would see it and then forget that you, okay. you canceled it.
So can I just do this? Can I not do that? Edit. Well, I just want, thanks for the right one. Joey, I know it was your voice was one of them. Yeah, I was just gonna say thanks for switching around and doing that uh, lesson today. Cause I think that's actually really, yeah, really helpful. So yeah, I just appreciated that. That was really good. Yeah. I think you're trying to change the wrong assignment. What Jill? Are you trying to change the wrong one? This is eight. Yeah, I am. Thank you. Okay. I just didn't want you to change it and have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> I would delete it and then, oh, oh those are the, okay. This is the one I want to get rid of. There, there, they're unpublished. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mike, do you have some questions? I just, I do have one really fast one. Uh -huh. um, so